Supposedly, supposedly, if my computer is not lying to us, we are indeed live. Hello, everybody. Hello. Welcome. Welcome to the Wednesday evening live stream. Glad you are here. Thank you for being here. As always, if you could, please leave a comment in the live chat just saying, yes, we can hear you. Yes, you are not completely quiet with a mouth moving and no sound coming out. So that would be pretty awesome if you could do that. So as I said, thanks for being here. Just a couple of announcements before we kind of get into everything today. I know it's kind of a, it's it's a strange Wednesday because it's the Wednesday before Christmas Ooh. and all through the house. It's actually really quiet here because <laughs> one kid's working and the other one's surfing the internet. So that's, that's what happens the night before the night before Christmas, I suppose. So thanks for being here. A couple things before we get into the topic for today. A few announcements, and those announcements are, one, the shirts, the reds and the orange tricolors were pretty much out of most all of the... We probably have like five or six of each left. Random okay. Random sizes. Of random sizes. So if you're a randomly sized person... <laughs> you may still be in luck Check there. It out. Yeah, and then the new ones will be on their way as soon as you decide to uh, to do that. <laughs> so that was the thing number one. Uh, thing number two is if you haven't yet seen it, I shared it this morning. Uh, Joanna's video, the Crips versus Anubius, very well done because really when it comes to plants, she knows more about plants than I do. There, are, she plants all of her tanks. And plants mine, I watch them grow, but when it comes to plants, I think you have a better relationship with them, a more knowledgeable relationship than I do. Well, actually, I think you're more involved than, than you know because I steal a lot of the plants from his tanks. That's true. That's true. But I don't know if that really counts as involvement or mm -hmm. just the victim of a theft and crime. <laughs> so, yeah, thanks for that. Uh, <laughs> that being said, we're going to do something we haven't done. We're doing a lot of things we haven't done in the last month or so. Uh, and that is, what do we got going on in your channel this weekend? Sunday, 6 o'clock. Central Standard Time. We're going to do a live stream on my channel to talk about aquascaping. So if you like aquascaping, it's going to be us. It's going to be the both of us Sunday, 6 o'clock, mm -hmm. uh, Central Time again. So if, if this is a time like, well, this is not optimal, maybe a Sunday evening will be. But if you feel like stopping by, hope to see you there. We are just going to hang out and do a stream. And you can drop by and say hello. And drop by and say hello. And I'm sure you've got a lot of really cool aquascaping things you want to talk about. So yes. if you love that sort of thing, hope to see you there. So we have stocking options. And I just already glanced through the live chat and I see that there are some questions, some things that need to be answered. And we are absolutely going to get to it because I think for the most part tonight, we're going to spend a lot more time with the Q&A. I think, as opposed to me just talking and talking for a long period of time. But I did want to kind of set the stage. And I think most of us are aware that when it comes to stocking options, the options themselves are endless. And it's really important that we, as fish keepers, that we get that part of, of fish keeping correct. Otherwise, we can have all kinds of problems. And in fact, when I go through and I look at the videos and I try to look at some of the comments, a lot of issues stem from having fish together in an aquarium that either don't match and so we wind up with maybe some aggression issues and have to deal with them and let's face it if you don't have a lot of fish tanks if you only have one or maybe just a couple if you have fish that are not getting along that can be really stressful to deal with because let's you know you're really excited when you go to the store you pick out this fish and a lot of times when we pick out new fish they become our instant new favorites at least for a little while and we put them in a tank and then we realize within a half hour, 45 minutes, sometimes a couple days, that the combination is not working. And I know that can be stressful. And so when it comes to stocking options, we really want to get that right. Not only that, but there are other issues you have to consider as well, besides just the aggression. And that is feeding. I, you know, I often talk about what I use to gauge what types of fish can be, fish can be together. And yes, their personalities are certainly one of them but what are you going to feed them? If you've got fish that are primarily going to eat 
kelp wafers and, and algae wafers and things of that nature, and then you mix them with fish that are primarily going to be meat eaters, that may not be good if those vegetable eating fish start eating a lot of meat. And so diet is certainly something to consider. Of course, water parameters. We wanna make sure that we're keeping fish that like to share, or at least can do okay in the water parameters that we can provide to them. Uh, the other things that we wanna consider is the tank size. And that's another thing where sometimes we get a little bit thrown off. I remember, I'm sure you remember this. Well, I, you claim to not remember the 75 gallon. Maybe you're like a really bad, actually, never mind. I'm not gonna talk to her. But Clint, <laughs> thank you so much. Merry Christmas and good Yule. Oh. Thanks for all that you do. Thank you so much, Clint. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Clint. Um, now, what was I gonna say? Oh, yes. So back really before the internet was a thing, I remember going to the store and there was this cute little fish, it was silver, and it was called a paku. And I asked the person at the store, I'm like, man, this looks a lot like a silver dollar. This was years and years ago. This looks like a lot like a silver dollar. Can I put it with my silver dollars? Will it get along? I have a 75 gallon, how big will it get? And dude's like, yeah, you can get good along fine with silver dollars. You know, they're not really very aggressive and they're only gonna grow in a 75 gallon, they'll only grow to about nine to 12 inches and then they just are gonna stop. So okay. I didn't do my research, right? And then back in those days, it was a little harder to do research because you couldn't just type on the internet, Paku, and like, oh my gosh. So I bring home this little fish. who's probably about the size of a quarter, cute little guy. <laughs> had these big eyes, stuck it in the 75 gallon with a school of silver dollars. And he would, he would just follow the silver dollars all along, all around the tank, and they got along fine. And then a month passed, I'm like, huh, this fish is now bigger than my silver dollars. And I'm not kidding you, it's, that's how fast they grow. And within about four months, the silver, the pocket was now like this, swimming around still with the silver dollars, but obviously growing very, very quickly. And then eventually we moved, we found somewhere to take the paku that was now probably a good eight inches in that 75 gallon that grew very, very quickly. Moral of the story is when it comes to stocking auctions, you really wanna do your homework, you do your research and make sure that the fish you have not only get along with one another, but are going to be okay for the fish tank that you provide to them. Mm. So that is certainly something to consider. Um, you know, I, I think the other thing too is, there's a couple other things really, is you wanna think about the activity levels of your fish. One of the mistakes that I made, I guess it's just gonna be about me making mistakes tonight. Cool. So I'm gonna share all my dirty laundry. Um, <laughs> speaking of laundry, last week we said that I was going to wear my ugliest Christmas apparel, and this is it. So I'm sorry if, first of all, I am a 49ers fan, even though I grew up in Chicago. I do like the Bears as well, but the 49ers are my favorite team, 1980s, you know, Joe Montana, Jerry Rice, and then later Steve Young, my all-time favorite football player. So I got this awesome sweater and it's obviously gold and red and I didn't really care because it's 49ers. But the problem is, and I think maybe the lighting here is making it even look not as ugly as it should be. Mm. But this is the sweater with my skin complexion and this thing does not go together. It makes it even worse. I'm not doing it right now because I didn't feel like it. But when I go to school, I wear this with khaki pants <laughs> and it's really bad because then you've got the gold and the khaki don't match. Oh, nice. Yeah, so when the gold and the khaki don't match, and my skin complexion along with the gold and this color red and the khakis don't match, it's a nightmare. It's horrendous. I bet. And well, you, it's supposed to be. You tried really hard. Yeah. Well, I've uh, got feet. Yeah, but I, I wouldn't say. I've got. Can you see my elf feet? I've got. So it's pretty ugly. Yeah. All right, you're gonna have to vote. You're gonna have to vote in the live chat. Who's got the uglier thing? Uh, no offense will be taken. This is something where we want to win. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, so, when I walked out, I said, "What do you think?" And you know what he said? He's like, ooh. I was like, ugh, yeah. yeah. And I got in trouble for that. Like five minutes before the live stream, he's like, I didn't really like the way you reacted to my shirt. I'm like, <laughs> you were was... trying to wear something ugly. I made a, an ugly sound. And you didn't even I... say like, it's nice and sparkly. Nothing. Because it's supposed to be ugly. Bonnie, thank you so much for the Super Chat. Green Bay Packers. Thank you, Bonnie. That is a team with a very historic mm -hmm. history. Oh. <laughs> you like that? Yes. Very historic history. Mm -hmm. So... And of course, as someone who the Chicago Bears are my second favorite team, I can't appreciate the Packers as much as you can because it seems like, <laughs> I don't even know now, it's been decades since the Bears have been slightly competitive. And my sister did move to Wisconsin a number of years ago. And my dad just like, well, she became an instant Packers fan, even though she doesn't know baseball from football. 
and my dad instantly jumped from the Bears to the Packers. I'm yeah, still trying to get you set. Just, so we're a split family here. That's Bears, just not even a thing. 49ers that that's, that and, should not be a thing that happens. Yeah. So back to my story. I'm trying to think what my story is. Oh, but wait. But wait. Dan E., Thank you so much for being a member. Welcome. Welcome here. Welcome to Primetime Aquatics. Mm. Appreciate you being here. So back to my story of how sometimes I screw things up when it comes to activity level for your stocking levels. And some of you have seen this. And in, in fact, a few people mentioned this in some of the comments section. I messed up one time. And years and years ago, I set up a 150. It's a four foot 150. And I had tinfoil barbs that were very small and some ballast sharks. And I actually got rid of some of the ballast sharks because I had a number of them. And the only ballast shark that stayed in that 150, quite frankly, the reason why it was there is because when I took those fish to their new home, I couldn't catch that one. Mm -hmm. He was the sneaky one. So I'm like, oh, and I didn't want to tear apart the tank. And those four foot 150s, as some of you know, they're over like 30 inches tall. So you're trying to get in there with nuts. I'm like, fine, he's staying. And he stayed. There's two moral of the stories there. One is large tinfoil barbs, large ballast sharks, didn't work out very well in a four foot tank, even though it was a 150. But the second issue was I had an angelfish in that tank that got quite large. And what I noticed is that angelfish and even some of the severums that were in that tank, they tended to stay out of the middle of the tank because those tinfoil barbs and ballast sharks were always taking up the middle, going back and forth and being all crazy, especially around feeding time. Finally, I moved the angel into a 125 with some other angelfish and that worked out really well. And we, unfortunately, we lost the tinfoil barbs and ballast shark to some type of something was in our water. When we did a water change, the next day we lost those fish, some of the fish on your wall, and a bunch of plecos in our 40-gallon breeder. So it was that was bad. But anyway, again, when it comes to activity level, that's something that we want to consider. And then finally, if, if you... Oh, we got another super chat. Thank you so much for Lowe's Aquatics. Merry Christmas to you. Uh, thank you so much. The... Um, if you're not stocking your tank optimally and appropriately, it's really easy to lose interest in the hobby because it creates a lot of stress for the fish, it creates a lot of stress for you, and then you've got fish that are either growing too fast or too active for other fish. And so if we get that part down and it really goes back to doing the research, we're gonna be in much better shape. So that's really what I wanted to say about wow. stocking. I know, I kept. I told you I was gonna keep it short today. And by the way, like I mentioned last week, this sweater is not only ugly, <laughs> but it's actually like three times thicker than a normal sweater. I think it just must be that quality San Francisco 49er, you know, history. Yeah. And I'm sitting on the heating vent. So it, <laughs> I'm not like sick or anything. If I start breaking out into a massive sweat, it's because I'm sitting over the heating vent. Mm -hmm. Plus I've got this sweater that's three times too thick, kind of like the Grinch's heart. It got three times too big. Mm -hmm. Little Christmas reference there. Nice. Okay. So let's see here. By the way, um, thank you so much to our moderators for everything that you do. It's, I can't tell you how helpful that is. Mm -hmm. You're the best. All right. So let's take some questions. Let's just get right into it. Let's see what we got here. Um, let's see. Brave Hearts, 1986. Yes, that 49ers history. Mm. I'm telling you. And I know this is going to be a controversial statement, and please don't take it personally to everybody who likes a football team other than the 49ers. I do believe, in my whole heart and soul, that the 1994 49ers may have been, I know I'm going to get disagreements here, may have been one of the best football teams I have ever seen in my life. Their defense, if you threw the ball, if the opponents threw the ball in the air, it was getting intercepted. And if Steve Young threw it up in the air, somewhere Jerry Rice was going to catch it. So... Even if he wasn't even on the field, he was still going to catch it and get a touchdown. So that's just the way it was. I don't know. Really? Okay. Owen, okay. I don't know about the angel. It will be fine if all the fish are big enough for the angel not to eat them. That must have been an answer to another question. <laughs> Let's see here. What do we got here? Okay. Let's sly. Oh. Bastoise? Blastoise? Mm -hmm. All sure. right. Remember, I can't see. So if I if I mess up your name, it's not because I'm trying to be rude. It's because I'm doing the best I can. Uh, what are, what is some unique schooling fish to go with angelfish and archer fish? Archer fish. Ooh. Well, I, I think I'm comfortable with the angelfish side of things. I haven't kept archer fish. They can get fairly large. 
I would say, well, again, I always say this. By the way, if you have fish going with other fish, if you can leave the size of the tank. So that's usually the most helpful thing when in the comments section is if I get not only the fish that you have, but the size of the tank. And that is usually the easiest way to answer that. So schooling fish with angelfish and archer fish. If it's a large enough tank, the Denison barb is super cool, otherwise known as the Rose Lion Shark. They like to actually school like midwater and lower, and they have really awesome colors. So if you haven't seen the Denison barb slash Rose Lion Shark, they have like a black stripe, and they have a red stripe, and they get a little bit of yellow to their bodies. And I have not found them to be overly aggressive. I think the other thing you could look at is the Colombian Tetras in a large enough school, and possibly maybe Congo Tetris if you have a large enough tank. So those are three that come to mind right away. Nice. You could also look at, I would say like fish the size of the skirt Tetras, the white skirt Tetras, black skirt Tetras. I tried doing it with uh, phantom Tetras and I didn't really have a lot of fin nipping issues there, but there were some tears in the angel fish fins and I, I suspect it may have been the phantom Tetras, although I can't prove that for sure. But phantom Tetras are some of my all time favorites. Okay. You got something? Yeah. How about, um, I saw a five gallon question oh, this is here. You. I lost it. Good for you. I... <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I believe it was a question on five, ga five gallon stocking options. And could one of them possibly be better? Yes. Uh, so could one, all right. So hold on. Five gallon stocking options. Mm -hmm. And can one of yet? them? No. You so fine. Okay. You can always re-ask the question too. Mm -hmm. So five gallon stocking options with a betta. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Well, we've got we've got a betta with uh, I always forget their name. What it uh, bottom bottom row of the nano of my nano wall. Oh, the white clouds. Yeah, the white clouds. Now that can be a little bit interesting because a lot of times people say, "Wow, white clouds and bettas." I I don't I didn't mm -hmm. realize the temperature issue. You know, white clouds are usually cooler water fish where the um, bettas can go you know, up to 80 degrees or warmer. White clouds, yes, they are, they can be cool. They are cooler water fish, but I've also found that they do perfectly fine at typical tropical fish tank temperatures, 76 to 78. So if you get right in that happy medium, that can be a good mix. We've had no problems with that. Mm -hmm. uh, the and other the gold one, tetras. gold tetras have been really mm -hmm. good. So I suspect the gold tetras are basically about the size of a neon but they're gold and they're really cool fish. They're so, beautiful. Yeah. Oh. Now, but we're talking about a five gallon, right? Mm -hmm. And so the white cloud, the problem with the five gallon, the white clouds and the golds, I think would probably prefer more than a five gallon. And so because of that, for me personally, I don't think I would necessarily put other fish in with a betta in a five because it's only because of the size. The one thing that we've done in all of our betta tanks that has worked for us and doesn't always work for everybody is mystery snails. Mm -hmm. So if you want to have like something else, mm -hmm. now I know it's not a fish, but I think you'd be safer with a mystery snail or a nearite snail compared to other fish in that size tank. Okay, what do we got here? Again, Clint, thank you so much for the super chat. I We did make sure we recognize and, that, right? Yeah, we have furloughs, yeah. Awesome, yeah. thank you. Thank you, thank you, okay. Oh, here's a good one. Legend fish tanks. Can South American cichlids be kept with Imbuna cichlids in a 90 gallon? If so, what type of South Americans? Well, there's two answers to this. Yes, sometimes. Would I do it with Imbuna cichlids? I don't think so. And particularly with the Imbuna, the reason why I hesitate with Imbuna is the diet. And I've said this a million times. You know, a lot of people bring up the water parameters and that, that can certainly be something to consider, but I found most hobbyists don't change their water parameters to fit the inhabitants of each one of their individual tanks, especially as they get more and more. Some do. Some will use RO water and then remineralize it for some of their tanks. Some will use their tap water if it's on the harder side. Some will try to add aragonite or something else to increase water hardness and pH in a tank if their water is naturally neutral and soft. But the issue is going to be the diet. That to me is the biggest thing when it comes to South Americans and Mbuna. Mbuna really don't do well on high protein diets. And so 
if I feed frozen bloodworms, I'm skipping over all my Ambuna tanks. I don't feed them frozen bloodworms. I don't feed them like uh, bug bites and stuff like that because generally they like to have more vegetables in their diet. So things like kelp flakes, kelp wafers, algae wafers. So the cichlid flakes that I feed are fine for them as well. So your South Americans are almost always going to enjoy some bloodworms and some meatier foods. And that's the reason why I tend not to mix them. Now, the other issue, particularly with the Ambuna is most of them are extremely colorful. And sometimes what happens that I've found, and maybe people have had a different experience, but with a lot of the South Americans, what's interesting about them is they have this, for the most part, very irregular sort of coloration. So you might have, you know, I'm thinking about uh, Vieja or something like that, where they got purpley and green, and or maybe like your typical Geophagus or your Jack Dempsey's, or your Green Terrors, where they've got all these other colors going on that they cannot mute for the most part. That tends to make Ambuna really angry, and they don't always win those. They don't always win those battles, but it's it usually means that they're going to throw down, and that's that's not a good thing. Mm. Yeah, I said throw down. I went street cred yeah. with that one. Wow, that was so. Very direct. So I probably wouldn't mix them with Dimbuna. Okay. Yes. Um, Jennifer, thank you. She just watched all my videos. Wow, that's yeah. awesome. Thanks for watching them. Glad you uh, can maybe get some inspiration because that is the, the most fun part of it. Uh, TB? Inspiring everybody else to make something fun. TB, thank you so much for your super chat. Your guys' Christmas shirts and decorations are so cute. Yeah. Looking for ideas. Safe bottom feeders for my Ambuna tank. Well, I don't want to take all the credit for back there, but I will take credit. You see the area? I don't know if you can see it, but did you leave it? Yeah, down by the floor there. Yeah, he did, I did that. I did that. That's really very magazine worthy. That basket was against the wall right behind me, and I thought, he moved that's it. a tragedy. Mm. So I picked that basket up, and I moved it. And I moved that thing like 18 inches. Yeah. And then I set it down, and then you know what I had to do? I had to balance that tree and that pillow so they both wouldn't fall over. So thank you so much. I appreciate it. And what what are being displayed? Would you like to? It was this was his idea. What we should display because I don't know if you noticed, but every single week the backdrop changes somehow. Yeah. Keep it fun. And yeah, the backdrop for us tonight is all those Santas, and I have a problem with them. Yeah, you have a function. I, I don't know what happened. I just started. We started collecting. I started collecting Santas, mm -hmm. and now I've got all those. Santa's back there. It's the most important thing for us when it comes to like Christmas decorating the house. Like we failed to put up our main tree this year, but I yeah. still busted out the Santas or you actually you did. And now they're here. Mm -hmm. So t can I, uh, let me go ahead and answer the question here then. Uh, so safe bottom feeders for my Ambuna tank. Some of it depends on how your Ambuna tank is set up. What we have in all of our Ambuna tanks are two fish that have done well almost without exception. And again, I realize that there are going to be people out there that's like, oh, that did not work for me. So always when it comes to cichlids, some of what I say, it's worked for us. Otherwise, I wouldn't say it. I wouldn't want to say something and be like, yeah, man, I tried everything you said. And so far, 99 out of 100 things you say really messes me up. So the two things that have worked are bristlenose plecos. Uh, always they always seem to work but there's a couple things that I tend to do with the bristle nose one I try to add them with a younger imbuna tank so the fish are still relatively small they tend to ignore them a little bit more and the second thing is I like them to be not super tiny where the imbuna might think hey is it possible for me just to eat this fish and the third thing is I want to make sure that the bristle nose pleco has somewhere to go so there's some rock work that they can kind of sneak in between because worst case is what they do is they generally, and, and this is not unusual for bristlenose plecos, but sometimes they'll kind of retreat when the lights are on. So you might not see it a lot. And then when the lights go off, like if you were to go into your, you know, by your tank, lights are off in the room and all of a sudden you just kind of shine like a little bit, not like a super bright flashlight because that would be very stressful, but turn the room lights on. A lot of times you'll see some fish out that you don't normally see and bristlenose plecos are one of them. So they do a lot of their work at night. And because of that, if you try that, if there's not a lot of algae in the tank already, usually I would like to throw maybe a an algae wafer or two down there after the lights go off, after the Mbuna can't see the food, I'll drop a couple down there for the bristle nose plecos to kind of snack on if they've taken care of all the algae. The other fish that has worked out relatively well are the uh, Cynodonis cats, especially the dwarf petrocola. And so we have those in our 75 gallon Mbuna tank, our 75 gallon peacock tank, our 55 gallon Mbuna tank, and they have pretty much left each other alone. But again, sometimes they'll hide. So you might, it might not be a fish you see all the time. 
So those are two that have worked out very well for me. Yeah, good question. Hey, Laugh Snails. Hi. Somebody Hello. says hi to me. I have to say hi. Uh, okay, okay, wait, wait, wait. Hold on. Hold on. Dan, Dan had a question. Hold on. First, I'm going to answer Dan's question for sure. But thank you, Lady Aquatics, for the super chat. Love San thank Francisco you. sweater. Thank yeah, you so much. Yeah. I'm a proud 49ers fan. <laughs> okay, what's your question? What's the okay, question? Dan has a question. Would you do peacocks or embuna in a 90-gallon, four-foot living room display tank? First of all, I'm jealous. Four-foot living room tank. Yeah. Well, I keep telling you we could do it. It's just... I know. We just got the floors done like last year. And so we, we made this deal mm -hmm. that once we got the floors done throughout the house, we weren't going to have tanks upstairs. We've already broken that rule because there's a tank over here in Joanna's, on Joanna's desk. It's like a five gallon. There's one in the bathroom. There's a 10 gallon in the bathroom. Yeah, there's two tanks there. in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. There's one back there. But I think we're still a little not yeah. comfortable <laughs> putting a 75 gallon there ruining our floors. So that being said, mm. what was the Kay. question? <laughs> oh, yeah, the 90 <laughs> gallon, the 90 gallon uh. in the living room. I think if it were me, and this is just my personal opinion, I, I would prefer the Imbuna tank in a 90 gallon. I I think it's easiest to manage peacock aggression like in an all male tank when you get to the six foot tanks or larger. And the second thing is, I just, I love the fact that with Imbuna, if you pick the right ones, they very rarely ever color down, they can't. Where if you get peacocks, even if it's an all male peacock tank, if you get two that have similar coloration, like I think last week I mentioned the Red Empress and the Lethronops, or you know anything where it's got like maybe a couple different types of Placidochromis and they're both generally blue, the, the more dominant male is gonna have fantastic color and the less dominant males are gonna try to mute that color as much as they can sometimes. So the Imbuna, they don't generally do that. And so maybe what you do with that 90 gallon is you say, okay, it's a, it's a decent sized tank, so you can put some Pseudotropius ACI in there, some labs, some red zebra, some rusty cichlids. Um, they're getting a couple. Possibly in a 90, you could probably look at some Kenny Ice. Uh, Pseudotropius Solosi would be a good one. You're going to get so much awesome color, a yeah. decent amount of activity, and it will be, it'll, it should be really cool. It's going to be a beaut. All right, what do we got here? Slinky Slink. Slinky Slink. Thank Question. You. <laughs> Thank you for the super chat, by the way. Is it okay to fill a 90 gallon with about 21 African cichlids and two plecos? What is the best way to keep pH stable? I have 95 pounds of crushed coral as substrate. What is best diet? New setup. Okay, so let's see here. We got 21 African cichlids and two plecos and a 90. I think that stocking levels are... So I'm not quite sure if the African cichlids are peacocks and buna or a mix, but I would say that 21 is certainly within the realm of reason, especially if they're peacocks because you've only got that four foot tank. If they're in Boone, you could probably do more. If they are still smaller, now would be the time to add uh, as opposed to after they become all adults. Two plecos are fine. Now, well, let me rephrase. The two plecos are fine depending on what they are. If they're like full, your standard plecos, those things are gonna get huge and you're gonna run out of room for them because now we're looking at a, a pleco that's gonna get 12 to 18 inches, potentially, and then they just like, just kind of lumber and sit there. If they're bristle nose or maybe some of the smaller, like dwarf sort of plecos that stay under eight to 10 inches, that should be fine. Uh, in terms of best way to keep pH stable, and I like that you said that. I like that we're worried about the pH being stable and not trying to hit a magical number. Although with, with African cichlids, we, we do wanna to try to be at least Certainly above seven. Ideally, when we get to that seven and a half or above, we're in better shape. And of course, the closer we get to eight stably, uh, the, the better off we're going to be. So when it comes to keeping the pH stable, you've got 95 pounds of crushed coral as a substrate. That's a great start. Uh, that is an absolutely wonderful start. I would say, are you having problems now? If you're not having problems now with stability, then, and the pH is where you want it. And I probably, I, I can't imagine it not being particularly stable, I would leave it. The other thing that you can do is, for instance, in some of our cichlid tanks, we like to add a couple different types of rock, uh, the Texas Holy Rock, and then also flagstone. And so if your pH is normally a little bit lower and your water hardness is a little bit lower, that flagstone can kind of help boost that. Aragonite can certainly help that. Uh, if you're having issues, the Carib Sea cichlid mix, can also be something to consider. Now, I know you've already got 95 pounds in your 90 gallon, which is 
I'm sure that the substrate is fairly deep with 95 pounds. It's probably at least an inch and a half. I mean, I know they're digging and everything, but the, yeah, the aragonite or the cichlid mix from carob seed can certainly be helpful as well. So all of those things can, can help. And if you're really, really, really good at managing pH, I was just reading the other day an article on using baking soda to adjust pH, but you have to be like, I, I would say that's more of an advanced thing. And so if you're comfortable with baking soda being used and, and making sure that you match the concentrations when you're doing the water changes, you know exactly how much water is coming out, how much is going in, and you really love to measure water parameters, and I kind of suspect maybe you are because you're asking that question, that's an option. But again, I would experiment with that with not your your tank, you know, maybe in a bucket or a different tank that's empty, just to see where that goes. Okay, um, this is a this is an interesting one. All right, Clint Walker. So I am putting the finishing touches on setup for my 125. Fun. First big tank. Nice. Rock Those on. 125s are so cool when you oh, get that yeah. first six foot tank. Oh yeah. My plan, and this is your fault, Jason, haha, is to put five top hose, three or four Severums. Yummy. And three or four pick this cats. Hold on, say that again. Um because I was zoning out. About Actually, it being I was watching. Your fault? It. You said it's your fault. Oh well, but yeah, I, I'm okay with that. <laughs> I'll, I'll accept full responsibility. Can you say the stocking levels again? Because I was watching something skip over here, and I was worried okay. that we were getting the lags. Oh, okay. Um, five tapahos. In what size tank? A uh, uh, 125. 125. Okay, five tapahos. Three Sweet. or four severums. Okay. And three or four pick this cats. Okay. Is that is that just that's what we're gonna do? Yeah, I, I love think, it. How, what are we thinking? I, I are so uh, the five top holes, I think you're going to be fine on a six foot tank. Like I said, we've, we've had four and a 55 for years. Mm -hmm. The reason that has worked, and I want to be very careful when I say you're going to be fine, is we have one male, three females. It just worked out that way. Sometimes, if you if like I had three males and a female, that may have not worked out so well, but that split has. But in a six foot tank, you could easily probably house two pairs in there. And if you wind up with like maybe two males and three females, you're probably going to be fine there. The three sevens will most likely work. Uh, we've had that. We actually we had three sevens in our four foot one fifty, and I don't recall there being any issues. We've had we ran uh, some sevens in a one twenty five. We've got a pair in a forty gallon breeder. They generally, what kind of sevens did it say? What type? So with the sevens, what I have found, and I and a lot of people kind of back this, was the green sevens tend to be a, a little bit more aggressive than the golds or the red shoulders even. Uh, so if they're greens, you may have a little bit more aggression towards one another. If they're the golds or the red spotted golds or the red shoulders, I, I tend to see less aggression, but I don't think you're going to see a lot of aggression between the geophagus and the severums. And the pictus cats in a 125, I think you're fine. Because they're the, the one thing about the pictus cats is they're extremely active, right? And in a smaller tank, that can look, that can be very stressful for fish. But in a larger tank, it's probably not going to be as big of a deal. Um, the, the one thing that you're, the problem, if it's, if you think it's a problem that you're going to have with the severums is you're not going to be able to plant the tank very easily without them destroying any plants. But if you're not worried about planting the tank, that could be, that could be a good mix. That's going to be awesome. Love it. Ready? Hold on. All right. Wait, I want, but I've got one thing. Okay. Uh, woodworker Royer, thank you so much for the super chat. Two angels, three epistle Borelii, 12 dwarf neon rainbows, one four inch bristle, bristle nose, three has brosis quarries, three pepper quarries, all less than one and a quarter inch long, 55 gallon. Will it work long term? Hold on, I'm just, I'm, let me just absorb. Yeah, let me absorb the stocking here. So 55 gallon, two angels. Yeah. Um, that, yeah, I think for the most part, that's probably, I don't, nothing stands out to me as like crazy, like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you did that. Uh, the only thing that you'll have to consider is the two angels, and that is if they pair, right? And that's just, even with your Borelii, if something pairs up and they're protecting fry, they, they're they going to get a little bit more aggressive, but you've got a four-foot tank. So I, it's not going to be one of these things where they necessarily push everybody into the corner of a four-foot tank. The angels would be more likely to do that than the Borelii, although the epistles like to also kind of take their, their fry on little walks, little swims around the tank. Um, but with the 12 dwarf neon rainbows, you're probably not, I, I wouldn't expect a lot of fry survival. Anyway, I'm assuming that breeding is not really a main concern. Uh, the quarries, three peppers and three has, yeah, I think that 
for the most part, I don't see why it wouldn't work. Um, and again, I always say have a plan because I, I, I've had people say, oh my gosh, I had an angelfish that was a terror. And that, that does happen, right? They're cichlids. But I don't see anything that would cause me tremendous amounts of concern. Okay, so hold on a second here. We are, oh man, now we're getting the skips. So I'm sorry if we're getting the skips, mm -hmm. the frozen skips. Mm -hmm. Okay, what do you got? Oh, Furloughs Aquatics had a question on plants. Plant illiterate, wondering what to put in a tank. Well, from my video today on the small scape, two of my favorite, especially for beginners, um, for anybody who wants easy easy plants, the Anubius and the Crypt. You can't go wrong. One of them, you're the, the Anubius. All you do is glue it, wrap it around something, wedge it between a couple of different pieces of hardscaping. There you go. They're very hardy. Uh, love them. They're the first plant that I ever tried. Fell in love with them. And then if you want something else, crypts. Uh, crypts are great. You plant those. So you're going to want to put something in the substrate, you know, root tabs or something. But you can't go wrong. You can always try uh, behind me here in that little tank is uh, moss. Java moss. That's yep. fun too. You can wrap that around or even uh, cut it up in little pieces and super glue it onto your hardscaping you know, your wood or your rock, whatever. And if I can do it, you can do it. That's true. That's definitely true. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so Crips, Anubius, and the question was just beginner plants, right? Yeah. Crips, Anubius, we, we did a video on some of our favorite plants. Um, if you want something floating, like hornwort works really well. Jungle Val can work really well. The secret that I found with Jungle Val that I actually learned from some of the people in our fish clubs is I was having a hard time growing it at one point. It was melting a lot, and then... Someone suggested, hey, just float it for a while. Put it in your tank and float it for a few weeks. Let it start to get its runners and a little bit of a root system and then plant it. And since I've done that, that has worked mm. flawlessly for the most part. So, And that could be cool because the jungle valve, unlike the Crips and the Anubis, it can grow very long, like the full length of your oh, tank. Yes. Uh, you just have to trim it back every once in a while. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's pretty darn cool. All right. What else we got here? Oh, for real fish keeper. Mm -hmm. How are you? So, Thank you. Sorry about last week's super chat. I sent my pink though was a was a fraud, oh. and I think Google froze or something. Merry Christmas, y'all! <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, I don't know about you. That's like one of my my things is like somebody hacking stuff. I just oh. I really that that freaks me out. So yeah. I'm glad Even that these days. yeah I'm glad everything worked out. Thank you for being here. Appreciate <laughs> it. All right, what else we got? So the lagging hopefully has stopped, at least on our side. It seems like it sort of kind of has, hopefully. Oh, hey, Dan, you saw the little aquarium, um, the little Anubius Petite wreath that I did? That was like last year. Yeah. I didn't think about that. Last year I did an Anubius wreath. Mm -hmm. This year I did a, a mossy tree. Yeah, so now you just got to combine the Anubius wreath and the mossy tree and see what happens. <laughs> All right, let's see here. What else we got? <laughs> Looking for, okay, hold on, legend fish tanks. Is it possible for me to breed in Buna cichlids with dragon blood peacock cichlids? And also, how can I set up my tank to encourage it? All right, so I guess just a point of clarification. Are you trying to hybridize the Mbunas and the dragon bloods, or are you trying to have them breed independently in your tank? Um, I think there's a chance that they could hybridize. Dragon bloods don't seem to be particularly picky about what they generally, you know, what they breed with. Uh, in fact, our dragon bloods have bred with just about everything in our 75 gallon peacock tank. Now those mm -hmm. aren't Mbuna, but I think there is a potential there for them to hybridize. If you're looking to breed them independently, that can certainly happen, right? Dragon bloods will breed with one another as will the Mbuna, but I, I don't, so, I don't necessarily, generally I don't encourage hybridization because one, you know, you get the purists who are like, okay, now we've got these mixes and a lot of people don't want to buy them. Um, so if you're trying to sell, and, and the problem is you could have, if, if, if they hybridize, you could have 30, 40 fish. And it's like, okay, well, that was fun. Now what do I do with all these hybrids? And sometimes they don't really look particularly appealing. This is sometimes they look okay. Like sometimes we get some really sweet OBs from our Dragon Bloods and Red Empress but you never know what you're going to get. 
and then they can be extraordinarily hard to get rid of and even people will frown upon just getting rid of hybrids because that waters down the natural stocks but yes th that combination of fish will breed if you're trying to like let's say you had some um, red zebras and now well, that's probably too close yellow labs and dragon bloods in that tank would the yellow labs still breed would the dragon blood still breed with one another probably and i would just pull the females out if you really want to keep the the fish the fish hardeep does an over does an extremely overstocked and buna tank disperse aggression better than a typically overstocked and buna tank i don't think so i think as long as you hit that overstocked mm -hmm. sort of level and again for us in a 75 gallon that's typical well, where we found really good synergy in that tank is somewhere in that 22 25 26 full grown in buna in a 75 so that kind of gives you a baseline at least for what we do if I were to add 30 or 35, I don't think I would see much of a difference other than the fact that I've got a lot of fish in there that may actually start to get stressed if it's way, way, way too overstocked. So we try to balance that. I'm trying to balance aggression with the just the, the what's healthy for the fish and what's going to help me not have to deal with massive amounts of maintenance. Uh, hold on, T-Bones, fishies. I don't, I just dot got in and I'm new here. Well, thank you so Welcome. much for being here. Appreciate it. Glad you're here. And yeah, feel free. If you've got questions, I'll leave them in the live chat. What All you right. got? Myrtle, our fabulous uh, moderator, I have to ask you, was it really your nickname in high school? Wait, what nickname? Mossy Tree. Mossy Tree? <laughs> hmm? Well, was it could, really? If that's true, we can change that up. You're going to become yeah, Big Moss. We're changing your name. Yeah, you're <laughs> you're now Moss. Big Moss. <laughs> yeah, Big Moss is our moderator. And uh, no, just joking, <laughs> Joanna. Well, too know. bad. I'm thinking the name's on there now. Yeah, Big Moss. <laughs> yep. <laughs> that that's that's some serious nickname right there in the right? fish community. You could change your whole thing and be like, who? Like all of a sudden, like if you're a moderator for other other <laughs> channels, like. Who's this big moss and why did I make them the moderator? Hey, knows what's going on. All right. It would be catchy though. Let's see here. Christian Riddle. Trying to stock my first cichlid tank. I bought unsexed juveniles. I've always heard that that you're not supposed to mix Mbuna peacocks and haps, but does this rule change if they're juveniles together? Oh yeah. It it's more they tolerate each other more when they're younger, but you could still run into issues when they age. Uh, a lot of it depends on the size of the tank. Like I said, I've been known to do some, some interesting mixes. And so I've had really mellow Mbuna, like Yellow Labs, Pseudotrophius ACI, mixed in with some peacocks, and they they just ignored one another. It was, it was, it was in my 150 when I had that 150 set up early on it was it was a very strange and it wasn't i didn't do it on purpose it's one of those things where you're mixing fish around trying to get stuff that works because other tanks are having issues and i wound up with yellow labs red zebras pseudotrophius aci those are all in buna um species 44 from lake victoria that species 44 in the aci the aci would follow him all around did it for years and years and years but i had them in with red empress lethronops intermediates which is a rather large hat and the Peacocks left the Mbunas alone in that setup, but there is certainly no guarantee that that's going to work in, you know, longer term. So I always say when it comes to cichlids, no matter what, even if you're doing everything the way that the internet and all the supposed experts tell you to do it, even if you're doing it all correctly, just have a backup plan because you just never know with that. I guess the good thing is at least the water parameters are relatively the same. And for the most part, you can make the diets work. So that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um... First, uh, Wolfman9234, trying aquarium plants for the first time. Sorry, plants just really okay. jump out at me right. here. Um, planting on a 10-gallon tank, what plants will not require a lot of pruning and maintenance and would not overrun the small tank quickly? Obviously, Anubias would be my, my first choice. Uh, they grow very slow, they don't overrun, and you don't really have a lot of maintenance. So, would you like to add your choice? Oh, I, th I think you're absolutely right. I think Anubias is by far the best choice. They grow super slow, um, generally, especially if you get the, like the Anubias nana. The other one is Java Fern. I think that could mm -hmm. be a good one as well. Although we, we personally don't have we don't great have luck lot. with it, no. but 
a lot of people do, and the mm -hmm. Java fern tends not to grow super fast. And what's cool about them is, and it's so cute, they make little Java fern babies mm -hmm. on the leaves. And so you'll see little Java ferns popping mm -hmm. up with little root systems, and you can just take those off and plant them. And it's it, I think, is like the easiest, one of the easiest plants on the face of the earth to propagate because they're just like, here's a leaf. Yeah. Here's a little baby. And you're like, oh, a little baby can come over here and just go right there. Uh, so that... Java fern and Anubias, I think, for a 10-gallon would mm -hmm. be a really good option. And depending, if you have a 10-gallon, so you might want some taller ones, just pick out different varieties of Anubias mm -hmm. that grow taller. Yep, and Java fern will get, it'll cover the mm -hmm. entire height of the tank. Yeah. Yep. Um, there was another one here. Uh, oh, yes, I saw killifish. Tiffany wants to know any thoughts on darter fish. What about killifish? Uh, looking for something different for my... Soon to be cycling 29 and 30 gallon tanks. Sweet. I keep 99% live bearers. Time to branch out. Wow. Exciting. Those are equal. Killifish are awesome. And oh, I love killifish. Unfortunately, oh. I am not a good source to answer killifish questions because I we've kept them. I, I, what have we Mostly kept? Mostly in my tanks, I think. Yeah. I, I don't even remember. Well, we've got the Florida least Killy, which is not what I don't think that's what you're looking at. Uh, what, are the, what are the killies that we have? We've got some in the 20 gallon. I don't remember what they are. Uh, they jump a lot. So that's the one yes. thing I, I will definitely tell you is if you are keeping Achilles, make sure your entire tank, the lid, you've got a tight fitting lid. I had maybe like a half an inch between the back of the tank and the lid. And we found all of ours on the floor in the course of a week. Mm -hmm. uh, darters are, are actually really cool. I th But the darters, depending on, aren't the darters? I haven't kept them, but I thought that they were North American. Right, and so in which case, maybe a little bit cooler water for the darters, possibly. Let's see, Alberto. <laughs> yes, I just had, I just had to laugh. I love my killifish, and that comment was made by that killifish guy. Oh well, there you go. You know, we have a we have a. It's a shame that we don't get to go to the club meetings anymore oh, because uh, one of the guys that we tend to hang out with at the uh, Greenwater Aquarium Society, he is like a killy expert he mm -hmm. comes in he's got them all he, you know and mm -hmm. killie breeders are an interesting group of people because they have like all these little they have this dark closet with these killie fish eggs and they trade them and they sell them and they get super excited when somebody's got something they haven't kept before mm -hmm. yeah they're like a subset of fish keepers that are really awesome and super interesting but i wish i could just call them right now and be like hey give us some give us your best killie fish they're so cute. all right hold on alberto are extreme krill flakes and bug bite cichlid formula a good daily regular diet for young geophagus top hosts? Yeah. Yeah, I would think that they would love both of them. I know for our geophagus top hosts, we feed bug pro and bug bites are very similar and they just love that stuff. So that's the nice thing with your, your top hosts. They're, they would certainly like to snack on some meatier high protein snacks being from uh, South America. Let's see here. Oh, this is a good question. Bad hombre. Any stocking options for a 75 gallon South American community tank? Oh my goodness. Yeah, there are lots of options. So it depends on what you're looking for. If you wanna stay with more fish on the smaller side and see more community dynamics, you have all the epistos, of course. You have, oh my gosh, uh, the rams. So the German blues, the electric yellows, the Bolivian rams are also really cool. They're not South American, they're West African, but a lot of same water parameters like the Crebensis or the pelvic acromis. Um, the dichrosis, the checkerboard cichlids are really, really awesome. You should definitely, so I know you're South Central American. If you're looking for the smaller kinds, check out some of the West Africans, like the checkerboard cichlids are absolutely fantastic fish. If you want to go a little bit larger, then you start getting, let's say on the smaller side, you could do the, um, the nanochromis are really awesome. If you, again, are on the West African side, the um, spundins that we have, mm -hmm. the, I always forget the genus of those things. What were those? Oh, no, those are the nanochromis. Yeah, the nanochromis are, are certainly something to consider. They stay on the smaller side if you want to get in the medium size. So now you're looking at things like firemouth cichlids, not necessarily keeping these together, firemouth cichlids, the acara, both the regular and the regular blue acara and the electric blue acaras, uh, can be relatively tame. Although I don't know about the firemouth and the electric blue acara together. Some people keep them together without any issues. Some have more. 
You've got the curviceps cichlids, the keyhole cichlids, which can be pretty cool. What else? If you go slightly up from there, if you go more than that, now you're starting to look at less of a community and more of like, okay, I want to keep a pair of something like uh, Jack Dempsey's or Green Terrors or something like that. Now, with those smaller fish that I mentioned earlier, they're nice because now you can start thinking about, okay, well, if I've got a pistol, so if I've got the checkerboard cichlid, if I have pelvic acromis or some type of crebenzis, what do I want to do with the rest of it, right? So now you're looking at, well, I can have at least a dozen quarry cats. Pick your favorite one. I can do midwater fish that are going to be pretty awesome. And although they're not, I know they're not from South or Central America, but I love to have rainbows mixed in with those. Um, your geophagus will work just fine too, especially like the tapajos. We have some uh, gymnogeophagus balzani in a 75 that's been working out pretty well. Uh, geophagus... I, like the wine milleri, those types of, like the wine milleri, the altifrons, cernamensis will work if you either have a pair, one male, maybe a couple females, or just one as a single fish. And then you've got all the schooling fish. Like I said, rainbows, denison barbs, hatchets on top. I know where I'm, now, I'm starting to mix continents, but that can work. The Congo tetras that I really like, that would probably be a good fit for like, I love the phantom tetras. Those are really cool. The black phantom tetras. So all of those could potentially be options. Mm -hmm. What say you? Oh, I thought you had a backed up question there. Okay. <laughs> oh, uh, let's see. There was one that I saw. Um, <laughs> oh. Here, I got one. Katrina over here, I have a, have a couple 10 gallon tanks. One just has a few otocinclus and snails at the moment. Trying to decide on some community fish to put in there, probably a nano school, chili rasboras. Yeah, that would be really cool. In a 10 gallon tank, chili rasboras, uh, the ember tetras, even like the the um, pork chop rasboras, are, they are so underrated. I, I did, I think it was an Instagram post maybe a month ago of the... Um, the rasboras that I had in the 29, I, I believe they were either, I think they were the hets, but oh my gosh, the like the bluish colors that they start to show when they get older are absolutely amazing. So you really can't go wrong with most types of rasboras. Maybe in a 10 gallon, the only rasbora I might not do is the brilliant green, just because they get a little bit longer and a little bit more active. Uh, but any type of rasbora, smaller tetras like the ember tetras, like I mentioned, would be all really cool options. What type of multis for a 10 gallon? That's from Legend Fish Tanks. What type of multis? Yeah. Like the like the Neo Lampalagos multis? I don't know. What kind of multis for a 10 gallon? Um, if it's, so if we're talking about the shell dwellers, you can do multifasciatus in a 10 gallon. The problem is gonna be once they get to a critical mass, which is somewhere, it's gonna be somewhere in that half a dozen, maybe eight, maybe 10 at the very, very most. If they continue to breed, you're gonna to have to get those babies out of there because they're gonna overrun that tank and then they start to fight a little bit more. Maltese are great and they have a good reputation once you give them their space to kind of spread out. But once they feel like they're boxed in, that's when more problems can happen. All right, I saw a question that I wanted to answer and now I mm -hmm. oh oh uh, Connor says geophagus snidactri are pretty cool too yeah absolutely the red hump geophagus are mm -hmm. definitely cool fish we've had those before and what's interesting about the geophagus snidactri you got to be really careful with them because they start breeding at an age you would never think these fish would breed at. they're like this big when they're really? this big however surprise, that big is surprise. like yeah all of a sudden you're like is my is that fish okay? Is there something stuck in her mouth? Nope, she's holding eggs. They are extremely prolific breeders. And that can be cool. And depending on your market, you might be able to get rid of them. But like around here, Geophagus steindacneri, I bred them a few times. I bred them probably three or four times. And I quickly flooded the market in the Chicagoland area. Like I couldn't get rid of them. I was bringing them to swaps and auctions. And the pet stores were like, eh, we really can't sell these very quickly. So but they are super awesome fish. The other one, the Geophagus, especially with the 75 gallon, because I forgot to mention, is Geophagus pelagrini. That's a really cool fish. We had a group of those that was 
they're, they're a little bit more rare, but they're awesome fish. Wait. Okay, wait. All right, don't look at the screen. Okay. There's a question here. What do you think of Garunian fish? The question's from Ray Garunian. Uh, yeah. <laughs> hello, hello. Hi. Welcome. Glad you're here. <laughs> Garunian fish. <laughs> Well, it's an amazing fish that is um, well known throughout the North American continent. Absolutely. And it's fantastic. <laughs> uh, Noel, welcome to Primetime Partner. Yes, thank you so much for being here. Appreciate you being part of this wonderful thing. Uh, thank you. Let's see here. Well, I just had another question. Oh, oh, legend fish tanks. I have a snail infestation in my 55 gallon. What are the best fish to deal with? the problem there are quite a few fish that can deal with that problem it depends on what's already in that tank uh, most African cichlids are going to take care of those snails in a hurry so anything from Lake Malawi quite a few Lake Tanganyikans Lake Victorians will most likely deal with that if you're like well thanks a lot but I can't keep African cichlids uh, a lot of the loaches now it's a 55 gallon so you got to be careful I don't necessarily recommend clown loaches in a tank a 55 gallon tank long term uh, but the tiger botillas will normally take care of those and they they don't get quite as large i'm trying to think of i mean we've had so many fish this so i'm trying to think of my fish room we don't make any we don't try to keep snails out of any tanks really mm -hmm. and basically if they're not in a tank it's because the fish are consuming them i remember i used to feed my Tinfoil bars, ballast sharks, severums loved snails. They would all eat the snails, and I had clown loaches in there as well. They would eat the snails. I, I don't have snails in just about any of my cichlid tanks. I'm trying to think of, oh, your uh, Nana, if you want a smaller cichlid that would fit into a 55, the, the Nanochroma Splendens. Mm -hmm. They absolutely destroyed every snail. Uh, in fact, they were stealing them from her pea puffers. That's why she had to get them out of her 12 long because of that. Yeah, they're so, maniacs. And, uh, let me keep thinking about that question because as we go through the live stream, I'm just going to start shouting out random fish. You're like, oh, that must be about the snails again. Uh, there was a question. I think I've seen it a couple times. I don't know if it was from the same person. What does it mean to cycle a tank? I'm going to answer that question. Are you? I want to, because this one, this next question is going to be shorter. Uh, mm -hmm. Or answer, ripple in water, seven inch Oscar in a 30 gallon. Is he too big for that tank or is there no rush in moving him to a bigger aquarium? Merry Christmas. I love your live streams. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for the super chat. Uh, the seven inch Oscar in a 30 gallon. Yeah, I would say I would, if it were me, I would try to get him out of there as soon as you possibly can because they, they just keep growing and they grow so fast. And I'm sure you did what a lot of people do like, okay, I've got this, I'm gonna to go to the store, I got this cute Oscar, or maybe you inherited them from somebody else who couldn't take care of them anymore, but it, it's amazing. That little one and a half inch to two inch Oscar with those big bug eyes, and they're so cute, they're like little puppy dogs, like oh, I'm gonna get this fish with every intent to moving them in a larger tank, and I don't doubt that for a second. And then all of a sudden, one month turns into two months, turns into three months, and pretty soon you're like, oh boy, this thing's getting big. And I we had three Oscars that we bought uh, that were relatively small, and I actually put them in a 55, knowing that I would need a larger tank for them. And I needed a larger tank for them much, much faster than I anticipated. So they eventually moved into a 125, but they grow really fast. And that seven inch Oscar can easily turn into something even larger uh, in a very short period of time. So I would I would definitely try to, to get that fish into a larger tank as soon as you possibly can. All right, now the question about cycling the tank, because I want to yeah. answer that real fast. Uh, first of all, it, we do have a video out on the nitrogen cycle and I actually complete the cycle because a lot of people think that cycling a tank, it, it, the way we use it in the fish keeping hobby is that you have fish that produce ammonia. It's a waste product. Most of the ammonia that they produce actually comes out of their gills, but some of it comes out as, as fish waste, uh, urine and, and even in the feces a little bit. That ammonia is very toxic to fish. So they're basically swimming in their own waste. What happens is there are microbial populations that can actually, for lack of a better word, eat the ammonia. When they eat the ammonia, their waste product becomes something called nitrite, NO2. So you go from fish produce ammonia, microbes eventually accumulate in that tank to a high enough concentration where they convert the ammonia, 
the fish waste into something called nitrite, which is also a waste product. This time it's a waste product of bacteria. That is also toxic to fish. There are different groups of bacteria that then basically eat the nitrite and convert that to something called nitrate, NO3. What we do as fish keepers is we want to manage the nitrate. It's not nearly as toxic as the nitrite or ammonia. But what we do as fish keepers is we do our water changes to make sure that the nitrate stays within a reasonable limit. Now for me, one of the goals that I like is to try to keep that nitrate concentration, that last one, to around 20 parts per million or less consistently. Over long periods of time, if nitrate concentrations are too elevated because we are not doing our water changes or we're not keeping up with tank maintenance, that can stress out fish. Uh, I tend to think of it, and I'm not the first person that's come up with this, but nitrate in a fish tank is kind of like a smoky room. We can live in a smoky room. There are people who go to work back in the old days when they were smoking in bars and on airplanes, and you can live in that. But over time, it tends to take its toll, and it can shorten a fish's life when there's high nitrates in the water. And so that's what we call the nitrogen cycle, even though it's only one half of a cycle. That's the part that we mainly are looking at when it comes to fish keeping. Mm. Okay. All right. Um, Ray had a question. Okay. All right. What cichlids would you recommend? I hope I get this question right. What cichlids would you, uh, colorful cichlids, would you recommend that don't totally jack up your tank and mess everything <laughs> around? <laughs> well, now that's a good, mm. all right. So that don't mess up your tank. Mm -hmm. We're doing that video. Yeah. We're doing that oh video. Oh boy, you've got yourself that, a video. That's, that's got to be an entire video. We're going to come out with that video in the next week or two. Um, that's an awesome question. Yeah. So the short answer right now, one that comes immediately to mind are um, rams. So Bolivian mm -hmm. rams and... That's true, they don't really... No, Bolivian rams and the neat. German blues for the most part, They I've had them in planted tanks. They, for the most part, will leave the plants alone. Yeah, they'll dig a little bit, in, like a, a small little impression, a little pit. Uh, when they're when they're getting ready to breed, but they're not prolific diggers. They're not sifting through everything and stirring a bunch of stuff up in a tank. They mostly leave plants alone. Um, if you're not planting a tank with live plants, uh, you have more options, I think. Uh, electric blue acara tend not to be overly obtrusive. Um, I'm trying to think of what else. A lot of the smaller, a pistogramma. I think a pistogramma for the most part. There's so many different varieties of apistos and they will mostly leave your, your hardscaping alone and they don't tend to dig much. Uh, those are, and there's a lot of options there between the apistogramma, the rams, and the acara. That's especially the acara if you don't have plants. Mm -hmm. TB, thank you so much for the super chat. Really appreciate it. What is the trick for removing small eggs off the glass without spreading them around or potentially causing an ammonia spike? Thank you in advance. Hmm. Small eggs off the glass without spreading them around. Are we talking about nearite snail eggs perhaps? Because I'm trying to think any other eggs or nearite snails or maybe you've just got pond snails, right? Because um, they'll leave like the little almost like mucusy like patches on the on the glass as well so nearite snail eggs are just a pain yeah you, you pretty much have to take some kind of a sharp object whether that's going to be an algae scraper or if you are a responsible adult a uh, a razor blade and try to get those off but the nearite snail eggs they'll even leave like an outline so not cool there the pond snail eggs are a little bit easier to remove because it, that's they're just kind of adhered to with like a mucus secretion so that for the most part you can just get rid of that with any almost any type of algae scraper uh, without spreading them around obviously is the is the issue right so if you wanted to be really careful so for instance you're like you know what i have a planted tank and i'm getting i don't want to get overrun with pond snails what you could do is take a turkey baster and basically squeeze it before you go into the tank go right next to the the, the snails the pond snail little mucusy thing and takes like a, a blunt side object whether it's a razor blade or an algae scraper and slowly scrape it off and suck that into the turkey baster is it going to be perfect probably not hmm. could it keep the snail populations down most likely more so than just leaving them there to do their thing forever and ever hmm. all right 
Noah, thank you so much for becoming a primetime partner. I appreciate that. Uh, thanks for being here. I hope you enjoy your experience. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you find it to be an enjoyable experience. And if not, it's probably going to be her fault. It's going to be my fault. Yep, we're going to make it your fault. <laughs> And then you get the cool, yeah, you got the cool little badge, too. So that's how that happened. They got the cool little badge. Did you come up with that little badge? I came up with all the little badges. Really? I did. They're all, the further you go, the, the they change colors and everything. Yeah. Huh. So it's kind of like, you know, like, I don't know, if like you're in the army or something. You get all those little things on your chest. Yeah. You get a different little color as time goes so on. So sometime we could update those to be cooler. Yeah, well, well, yeah, actually we could. You could uh, that could certainly be something that you could I do. Think that just went on my yeah. list. Yeah. And you go like from like They're corporal like to sergeant They're to like stickers. pretty soon you we'll won't have like major gen stickers. general like you know lieutenant majors in there or something. It's going to be not. awesome. All right, let's see. I think we're going to do like a few more questions here. Wait, speaking of which, though, can I uh, interrupt for a moment? No, I don't know. I believe. Uh, I forget where Alfredo. If I've got the know. name right, he was excited to get his shirt so he can walk into his local fish store like a boss. All right. Just to explain who the shirt's from. Yeah. Because they probably won't know. Hey. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I appreciate you uh, sporting the gear, especially <laughs> at the the fish store. And be like, now don't try to pull any funny stuff on me. That's right. You see this? Got a shirt. This means I know things. All right. <laughs> I don't know if they'll believe that, mm -hmm. but. Mm -hmm. uh, try it. Let me know how it works out. Okay, hold on a second here. Jaden's got a question. What are some good tank mates for a 15 to 20 gallon for neon tetras? I was looking at one or two honey grammy or a betta fish. Uh, so 20 gallon. Let's just say it's a 20 gallon, standard 20 uh, with some neon tetras. That's cool. So maybe you're going to put like eight or 10 neon tetras in there and you want to do a honey grammy. I think that would work just fine. I think the betta, don't mix the betta with the honey grammy for the... Yeah, I, I don't know how we well that's going to work. We did that and it it didn't last it didn't long. work, and I didn't think it was necessarily going to work, and we had to move the honey grammy out. But a honey grammy with tetras would probably be just fine. Will the better work out with the tetras in a twenty? Most likely. Uh, the, the only the only thing that you have to think about is if the tetras decide to pick at the better at all, you might be better off with a better maybe going with a, a shorter fin better or even a female. Then I don't think you'll have really hardly any issues there. So, um, yeah, let's see what else with the tetras. I mean, you've got a lot of options with tetras at the bottom. You could think about pygmy quarry cats. That'd be pretty cool. They have six or eight of those in a 20 gallon along with maybe eight to 10 neon tetras. Uh, for your algae crew, you could do a clown pleco. Might be pretty awesome. You could do some either the dwarf bristle nose or a standard bristle nose. Maybe get yourself like one that's pretty sweet, like a long fin blue eyed albino or mm -hmm. the calicos or a green dragon or something you know whatever you like yeah. you know Those um, are sweet let's see what else for the 20 with the neons I, I if you're looking for like centerpiece type stuff even in a 20 gallon again the the epistos the rams a single one I, the epistos you could probably do a pair but maybe with the rams i might just go with one mm -hmm. um yeah <laughs> so all those are good options merry christmas noel merry christmas let's see here Oh, wait here. Evan, hello. What could be tank mates for 15 frontosa in a 7 foot 225? Wow. The fronts are juveniles currently. That is going to be wow, an awesome tank in about 10 awesome. years. <laughs> <laughs> That's a frontosa joke. Uh, <laughs> it is going to be a great tank. You're going to have to have a lot of patience with those fish. If you're looking long term, I would say nothing. And the reason I say that is 15 frontosa, even in a seven foot tank, you're gonna to have to remove some of them, most likely. They're not very active. And it's gonna be a long time before you have to worry about that. So I, and that's very common. So what you've done is, is not anything unusual. Like, I can't believe you tried to do that. Um, I think a lot of people go that route and they will get a, a lot of frontosa just like you did. And then maybe you trim that down to a group of 10 in a seven foot 225 and you sell off five and probably make a decent amount of money if you grow them up to a size that is like, hey, I've got uh, five, seven or eight inch frontosa that I'm looking to get rid of. Those fish can go for quite a bit of money. It's gonna be a long time. Still, uh, you've got options there in terms of, the, the tank mates that I would do would not be other cichlids. They would be things like the, the Petricola cats, um, Cynodonis, I should say. Cynodonis cats of pretty much any any kind will be okay. Uh, you could potentially look at 
some type of bristlenose type plecos. And the reason why I say the frontosa, I, I don't want to mix that group with a lot of other fish is you're going to have a couple things going on there. As you know, the reason why you picked out the frontosa is when they get older, the coolest thing about the frontosa are the fins and those long trailers that they get on the dorsal fins and you know, it's on the tail fins and everything. And these mm -hmm. fish get amazing. They're not, even though they're large and they look menacing, they're not very aggressive and they're not very aggressive eaters. So they tend to get picked on by just about any other type of African cichlid, especially when those other African cichlids get a little bit older. I have seen four inch Ambuna just absolutely terrorize 12 inch Frontosa. So patience with them, you're gonna have an amazing tank. It, it, it's gonna take a little while. Look at the non cichlid sort of, like I said, the, the Synodonis cats, maybe bristlenose to kind of clean things up. And I think you're gonna be happier in the long run, but that's gonna be a great tank, very cool. Okay, let's see here. Kenzie, what tank mates would you suggest for a 20 gallon tank with a betta and shrimp? They are in a 10 gallon right now and get along fine. I'm waiting to upsize so I can get more fish. Hmm. So the betta and the shrimp, I'm glad they're doing well right now. Yeah. I, <laughs> if they're doing well right now, maybe they'll be fine in the 20. I've always been hesitant to mix. The reason why I pause is, I'm personally hesitant to mix those because I've seen bettas and shrimp not get along and then the shrimp always wind up on the wrong side of that. But if yours are, and, that, and bettas can be very different. As, as most of you know who have kept bettas, like I say, oh, hey, you can keep bettas with mystery snails and I'll get a dozen comments that said, yeah, I tried that and the betta, I had to remove the mystery snail. So in your 20 gallon, I think a couple things. One is you're gonna wanna set up places for heavily planted areas for your shrimp to potentially retreat to and maybe even to have some babies survive, which would be pretty cool. Uh, tank mates in the 20, I think everything we said earlier when it came to most types of small rasboras would probably be okay. Uh, we've talked about the gold tetras. We've, um, in a 20, we've mentioned otosynclus, if you've got the water parameters for it. Clown, I'd really like clown pleckles. Now, those fish are always overlooked, and we've got a group of them right now that are, are growing out they're really awesome. They don't get quite as large as bristle moles. They've got a lot of really cool color. Uh, the the thing is, you got, you got to stay small, right? So that's why I say the rasboras. That's why I say smaller tetras because your shrimp are your concern right now, and and you want to make sure that those things survive. And of course, you can add in things like mystery snails and stuff like that, or nearite snails if you want to add a little color. But that that's really your goal is stay on the smaller side. Uh, even like the honey grommies, I think might you might eventually see your mystery your uh, shrimp go missing Bye -bye. yep yeah uh abe thank you so much for the super chat thank you does five tapos one severum two electric blue acara one blood parrot two bristlenose work in a 75 gallon currently cycling my take want to do it right five tapos one serum two electric blue acaras one blood parrot i all right so i'm fairly if i had to, if i was a betting man and i don't generally bet but if if i were to bet on that, I would say eventually the blood parrot and the severum are going to duke it out to the point where the blood parrot's going to win at first because they tend to grow a little faster. They're a little bit more active, a little bit more um, confident in themselves. And then that table is going to turn and that severum is, and it doesn't happen all the time. Uh, I know this combination has worked for some, but that severum eventually may very well turn around and decide, you know what, I'm tired of this blood parrot always chasing me around, and oh, by the way, it can't even bite me, and so I'm gonna push this thing into a corner. I, I, I've had that happen before, so I might pick one of the two. Um, the other potential thing that you've got going on, five tapahos and the two electric blue acaras. My spidey senses tell me <laughs> that there's a chance when they get older, it, it may not be a problem now, but when they get older, those top of hosts may decide that they're going to push those electric blue Acara around a little bit. So if it were me in a 75, I'm, I'm thinking long term now, right? I think it works fine for about six months until that severum and that blood pair start to duke it out. And I think it works fine for another six months before the top of hosts and the electric blue Acaras start to duke it out a little bit. Electric blue cars are not aggressive and the top of hosts really aren't overly aggressive either. If it were less top hosts, would that work? I don't know. The other issue you're gonna have is the five top hosts, you are almost undoubtedly going to get a pair. 
And when that happens, they're going to certainly take up half the tank, about approximately half that tank, trying to protect their spawning area. The bristlenose will most likely eat the eggs, so they won't be around long. But if they do start to come up with a breeding area, they're going to push the other three Tapajos to the other side. Try to do that to the Severum, although I don't know how successful they're going to be. And certainly the electric blue car. So then you've got a lot of fish on one side of the tank. So that long term would be my concern. Now, the way to deal with that is maybe we decide not to do the Tapajos or not to do the electric blue car. We pick the Severum or the Blood Parrot. Bristle nose are fine, and then see where that goes. We could also consider cutting down the top of hose to maybe a, a few, right? Like three, and then if you get a, a pair, worst case is they're pushing that other one off, but not as many fish. That long term, I'm thinking they're going to probably push more of those fish off. But that was a great question. Okay, let's do uh, let's do like two or three more questions, and then we'll we'll uh, get to our holiday weekend, I suppose. Hold on a second. I saw a good one. Um, where did it go? Where did it go? Oh, Zach, can I keep angelfish with penguin tetras? Size-wise, not a problem. If you've got the appropriately sized tank, diet's fine. Water parameters are fine. The only thing, I've kept penguin tetras. I haven't kept them with angelfish. They were a little bit more, I don't want to say aggressive. It's not like the Buenos Aires tetras per se, but... The penguin tetras were slightly more aggressive than a lot of your other types of tetras, like the neons and the uh, white and black skirt tetras and, you know, that kind of thing. So the only concern you may have, and you may you, it may wind up being fine, but you might have some thin nipping issues at some point with the penguin tetras. They tend to be a little bit more nippy than some of the others. But again, I, I can't say for sure, but I'd have a backup plan. Um... Mary Page is on the road. Hey. Heading to Kentucky. Have uh, have a nice drive. Merry Christmas. Yeah. Stay safe and have a to our a, one of our favorite moderators. Yep. Yeah. And then there's a um here's a this is a really fun question. Are you ready? Yes. Um this is uh let's see here. Um oop, I just lost oh it's from Bad Ombre. Okay. What fish are you personally looking forward to keeping next in your fish room? I know what I'm looking forward Ooh. to, but I'm not going to say. Well, it's a secret. I don't know if I necessarily have any fish like on the horizon, like I'm going to buy these fish tomorrow sort of thing. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I mentioned there was a, a couple fish that I really like that I don't currently have. And one of them is the Species 44 Lake Victorian. I love that fish. I love the color. I've had them in the past. I really, when I first saw the fish room, if you looked at my stocking list of what I wanted to keep, the species 44 was in my top five. Like I wanted a 40 gallon breeder just to breed those fish. And interestingly enough, mm -hmm. I haven't kept them since I set up the fish room. So mm -hmm. uh, it's crazy. Uh, the other thing that I really am keeping an eye open for if they ever come around my area are the purple spot gobies, which are amazing fish. They get about that big with a huge mouth and tiny little eyes and they get all purpley and <laughs> They're, they're really awesome. They're crazy lazy, but they have great personality. So that would be another one. What do you got? Well, mine's a secret. <laughs> well, that makes for a really interesting <laughs> answer on a live stream. So <laughs> those are two. Those are two that if I see them, I'm going to buy them. The other one that I, I don't have space for it right now, and that is um, the Mascaheras uh, Argentia. And that is an absolute jewel of a fish. It just looks amazing, but they get large. They're fairly aggressive. And I don't have a tank sufficient for their awesomeness. So, but those are three great ones. Great well, question. Wait, Lumpy Dog has a fun question. Oh, yeah? Centerpiece fish with personality for a 20-gallon long. Well, if you think it's such an I, interesting yeah, question. I, what do you got, girl? No, I'm curious what you're going to say. Oh, you just want to see what I'm going to say? Yeah. That's, okay. Um, wait, let me see. That is a great question. 20, for yeah, 20 centerpiece long, let me think with a great personality. It. Um, I'll tell you right now, and you will disagree because you had a problem with them, but I love those nanochroma splendens. They are, right. they have a wonderful personality. Mm -hmm. I also like, look at the rhinogobius gobies. Oh, They're yeah. not cichlids. And we had a group of, I think when we first purchased them, I think we had eight or 10 of them in a 10 gallon. Mm -hmm. And they were, they would like lay, I did a species oh. profile on rhinogobius henna Now they're not super colorful, 
but they're like some of the goofiest fish. Oh they would pi- like when we do water changes, they would all go by this log and form a big goby pile. <laughs> and then the water change would be over, and then like there'd be three or four of them. They would still form like a almost like a goby pyramid and just pile up on each other and be like, "What's up?" And the males, they have these so big funny. silly mouths. And yeah, they look so, grumpy all the time. Yeah, but they're, they're so also fun. silly. So rhinogobius would be one of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, the nanochromus would be one. If you like slightly more aggressive, but really good personality, but still small, the nanocara would be another one. Mm-hmm. Nanocara anomala. Mm-hmm. Absolutely fantastic fish. I did a fish room tour of creative pet keeping. The last one I did, and she had a group of them. She was breeding them for a while that were really, really cool fish. So try those check those out and again the nanochromus there's more than just a splendid so those are all they stay rel- most of them stay relatively small and might work uh, dichrosis would be another one uh, the checkerboard cichlid those are on my mind that's another one that i would love to add to my fish room give you the pointy finger there all right let's do one more question how about that okay let's see here oh we've got a new member thank you so much michael appreciate you being here man all right Let's see. Oh, here's a good one, Nicole. I'm not colorblind, but I have a real hard time telling the difference between shades on the API master test cut. Any suggestions? Yes. Me too. A lot of times, and I wish when I was working with that, one of my regrets when I was working with that test kit when I did the video, when I, I like all of them, is I did a very bad job of showing the best way to read the colors. The way that test cut kit is best read is you know how you've got the card and it's got all those colors. The best way to do that is actually read the tube from the top down, like almost like you're looking through the liquid, all right? Safety glasses would be a really good idea anytime you're using aquarium chemicals. But if you put that against a white background in a well-lit area and you look straight through, like down from the top of the tube, you're gonna get a much truer <laughs> color then if you're trying to, because it is, you're absolutely right. It is such a pain. You're, you've got the, you're holding up the card, you're holding up the tube, and you're going all these different lights. You're like, oh, I don't really know what the heck's going on here. But look at it from the top down. Second thing is, don't stress a lot about this specific color and, and trying to determine is this 10 parts per million? Is this 20 parts per million nitrate? Is it 25 parts per million? I always just run it real quick. Let it do its thing. If I've got to wait, I wait. If I don't, I'll look at it right away, depending on the test that I'm running. And I approximate. If I've got, you know, if, if it's something that's supposed to be yellow or maybe like a real light pink, and all of a sudden it's, it's changing into that shade of area where it's like a dark red, then I know I've got some work to do. And I want to try to get it into a lighter shade. But as far as trying to read it exactly, obviously with the ammonia and the nitrite, you want that to be zero. You don't want there to be an issue there. But with the rest of them, you're just trying to get close enough where you've got an approximation. And, and that's usually at least good enough for me. Dan E., thank you so much for the super chat. Have a Merry Christmas and Happy New Year's. Uh, you guys all do the same thing. I am... We are really happy that you are here. Have a great holidays. Uh, you know, for those of you who are celebrating Christmas, be careful out there uh, tomorrow and Friday. Yeah. And yes. yes. And so, yeah. And if you've got time, you want to hang out again, for those of you who weren't here when we did the announcements, we are going to do a live stream on Joanna's channel, The Small Scape. Uh, we'll do that Sunday at six, just kind of switch things up. She's going to be talking. Well, I'll be there as well. We'll do the same Q&A type of stuff. Mm-hmm. And we will... Um, talk about aquascaping because that's kind of her thing and kind of you know so if you're into aquascaping check that out the small scape i will send out that notification probably not until tomorrow maybe Mm -hmm. but yeah it should be fun we've had a lot of comments like wish it was wish your stream was a little earlier or a different day a different day so we're gonna try and plus it sounds really really cool the small scape sunday at six very easy to remember lots of alliteration there you go yeah And we will still be back next Mm -hmm. Wednesday, same time, same place, for the regular live stream next week. Again, thank you so much. Have a great weekend. Merry Christmas. And we will see you, hopefully, on Sunday or at least next Wednesday. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye.